Hello and welcome to Unit 11. This is going to be a biological productivity and energy transfer. Um, this is the uh, front package and basically what you take a look at is chlorophyll concentration down here. Red is what we want because if we actually get chlorophyll, which are the phytoplankton producing oxygen and sugar for the environment, um, like you can see some of these areas, actually some are inland, but the oceanic ones are usually with uh, high river runoff or cold water coming off of the polar areas as you can see some of the colors down here and as we get to the blues um, dark blue um, sorry we go this way we get to the oranges and then we get to the yellows and most of those yellows you see are actually off of continents because we get a lot of the nutrients going into the ocean coming off the continents and then once we get the nutrients in the water phytoplankton takes off and that's what's producing chlorophyll the chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B the green pigment and this is all looked at uh, by uh, satellites from way far above the earth 11a photosynthetic productivity first thing I'd like you to do is to draw I don't know why it did that. I'd like you to draw this photosynthesis equation and aerobic respiration equation, understanding that the reactants of one are the products of the other, and the products of the first one are the reactants of the second one. So photosynthesis is actually creating the glucose with uh, carbon dioxide and water and the sun's energy, as well as oxygen for us and also plants who do aerobic respiration where they take the glucose they breathe in oxygen and they give off carbon dioxide exhaling it and plants do this just as well as we do and giving off water and energy and the energy is ATP here is a uh, chlorophyll inside of a plant cell and we have what are called light reactions and dark reactions or we have light uh, and uh, light dependent reactions and light independent reactions or we have light reactions in Kelvin cycle and if you take a look at it um, the carbon the water and the light the water and the light go together to and to actually the chlorophyll to make the oxygen and the carbon dioxide goes into the cytoplasm um, to actually make the sugar and you can see there's an energy transfer where ATP that energy that ATP goes into there and then it produces ADP to be re-energized and NADP comes into NADPH which gives the energy for the light independent this only happens during sunshine because you need sunlight this happens 12 hours of sun and the 12 hours of night so it basically happens 24 hours a day so the cells are actually producing sugar all the time they're only producing oxygen when there's sunlight we also have things that are called gross product, uh, primary production. Um, this is basically what comes out of the system, which in this case is oxygen, uh, minus the respiration. The plants respire just like it to give us net productivity. So the net productivity is where we take the gross and we take out the respiration and it gives off net. So the net productivity is basically what's given to the environment by the plants minus what the plants need for the uh, actual cellular respiration. Um, new production, so we can actually make new oxygen, new sugar, as well as regenerate, um, where we can actually produce, uh, you know, the products of one are the reactants of the other. So we're just regenerating this material and then taking the products, putting them into the reactants, and then taking the products, putting them into the reactants. Um, as well as uh, taking the ADP, turning it into ATP, turning it back into ADP, and all we have to do is keep putting in the sunshine and the water, and we can actually re-energize, and then take the carbon dioxide, and we can de-energize, um, producing the oxygen and sugar, which all life needs. Here's that picture again. Um, remember, high chlorophyll, much better, because the phytoplankton, the food source, the little critters for the bigger critters. Um, you can also see uh, the uh, basically land vegetation, the uh, so the vegetation on land, and you can see uh, Africa, Arabia, India, um, part of Soviet Union and China, and then all the way over to western part of the United States, and then also Australia, New Zealand, South America, South Africa, 
Um, but those are the dry areas where you get very little productivity. Here's a food web and a food chain. Food chain actually just showing you the energy from the sun going through a uh, straight line and energy from the sun kind of going to there, to there, to there, uh, to there, to there. So is that the food chain is looking at one of these where the food web is a much better representation of an entire marine or terrestrial uh, environment. Measurement, how do we actually measure uh, photosynthesis? or chlorophyll and or plankton. We use a plankton net which we can drag behind a ship. Big opening um, traps the small critters. Um, big nets for fish do not trap plankton. It has to be very small and the ship's moving usually small enough and the opening is always open so if a fish happens to get in, fish probably can swim back out. But we do get some fish death this way too but very 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 little. You can also use the grand method. This is for oxygen concentration, where we put a chain down from a boat, and on one side we hang clear bottles, and the other side we hang dark bottles. We put uh, photosynthetic uh, back, uh, plankton in these bottles, and we drop them down, and we actually measure the amount of oxygen, and we lose it because of respiration, and we gain it because of photosynthesis. And if you take a look at the clear bottle, clear bottles um, actually produce more and more oxygen as we go down and then it gets less and less and less and then we get below uh, a certain depth they're saying here it's uh, 70 meters so 230 feet they're saying basically the light uh, disappears at that depth and then we just get loss of oxygen and then the loss of oxygen is pretty constant because the algae is actually burning the oxygen at a steady rate all the way down regardless of whether it's producing it or not producing it. And then we can also look at chlorophyll levels. Chlorophyll likes reddish color light. So if you take a look at the top layer, um, we have basically white light here at the top, and then the red light disappears, purple light disappears, go down a little more the yellow, then the green, and the dark blue, and then the light blue is the one that penetrates the deepest. And this one is also showing you meters, so you can see it gets about 300 meters deep but then there's no light whatsoever. Nutrients and availability. Nutrients that the critters are looking for is nitrogen, phosphorus, iron, and silica. And that actually is main source is from river runoff. And coastal waters are very high productivity. And we can also get recycling of these because of upwelling. And if you watch this, we have nutrients way down here. And it sweeps up. So we can actually bring the nutrients to the surface, but as soon as we get that, we get the phytoplankton uh, burning it off, and then eventually, if it doesn't keep doing that, or if the wind system shuts down, well, remember we need surface winds going this direction to get up while it's coming this direction, it just doesn't come up by itself. Um, these currents are actually really slow, so uh, they're more likely going to stay there unless we can evacuate the surface water. Here's a picture I'd like you to draw. This is solar radiation. Um, the, because the Earth is curved, uh, the places on the surface do not get the same amount of solar radiation. If you take a look here at the equatorial region, um, we have a beam of sunlight coming through. We also have it here through mid-latitudes, and if we drew it up here for the poles, um, we'd find out that the farther we get away from the equator, the more spread out the light gets. And because the light spreads out, it also reflects more. And because of that, this area up here, A, does not receive the same amount of solar radiation, solar radiation as B does. So the tropics actually are much warmer, much more sunlight, much more plant uh, material. But it also tends to be very poor nutrients because so much sunlight and very little nutrient uh, input. And the phytoplankton burn off pretty much any kind of nutrients that are there. So latitude, um, big difference in how much radiation you receive season. Here's uh, the North Pole pointing towards Polaris on this side of the Earth. Six months later it's on the other side, which is what this is. And if you take a look, half the Earth is lit up by sunlight all the time. During our winter, and you can tell it's our winter because uh, if you take a look at the amount of light this circle or this circle spends in the light zone, it's much less than it is in the day zone. So this is the, our winter. This is our summer where our circle is spending more time in the half that's illuminated versus the half that's not illuminated. This would be our summer. Um, if you take a look at it, the Antarctic circle is lit up completely 
during our winter and the Arctic Circle during our summer. No Arctic light, so seasonally very little productivity up here where you get a lot of it really close to where the direct rays are hitting. This is 23 and a half degrees. This is the Tropic of Capricorn. Here's the Tropic of Cancer. But seasonal variation also in terms of radiation. Time of day, daytime, nighttime, much more productivity in the daytime. And if you're in the U for euphotic zone, euphotic zone is actually where lots of light is penetrating. Then you have the dysphotic and you have the aphotic where there's no light. This is the kind of hazy, shadowy, and it gets less and less sunlight as you go down until it's all gone. Uh, insulation and latitude, I'd also like you to draw this, but I want you to pay attention more to this green line, the average number, because if you take a look at this blue, uh, during the winter solstice, the southern hemisphere receives a lot of sunshine, but when it gets to the summer solstice, almost none, especially the high latitudes. Uh, this would be the south pole, this is the north pole. So the south pole during the winter solstice, lots of sunshine. South Pole during the summer solstice, almost none whatsoever. In fact, it actually says it's none, and that's above 66.7 degrees, which is the Arctic Circle, no sunshine whatsoever. Same thing for the Northern Hemisphere. We start off in the Southern, uh, we start off in the winter solstice with no sunshine, and then you can see the sunshine actually goes up and up and up and up and up. And in the Northern latitudes, we get lots of sun in the summer. And if, but if you look at both of these lines and you put them together, we get this green line. And then notice that during the, at the tropics, the sunshine is not as bright as it is in the southern hemisphere during their summer or the northern hemisphere during our summer, but it still gets more energy because it's in the tropics. So the tropics don't get as bright and they also don't get as dim. Um, they do increase uh, throughout the year. Um, but basically the tropics are pretty much the same all year long. Average looks like this. Southern Hemisphere, not as sunny. Equator, most sunny. Northern Hemisphere, not as sunny. And again, it depends on the season. Light in the ocean, solar radiation peaks in the visible wavelength, and that kind of makes sense. Our eyes see visible light. Um, this is called a black box, and in astronomy, we actually talk about uh, the temperature of the sun or the star. Uh, our sun is about 6,000 K. It's about uh, 6,300 degrees Celsius surface temperature, and at that temperature, we produce mostly yellow light. Uh, that's the color of the sun, but we also produce white light because we get all the colors. As the, as the star decreases surface temperature, the maximum amount of sunlight that it produces moves towards these larger wavelength red light, and then eventually gets to 4,000, and that actually produces mostly light that we can't see, and 3,000, almost no light. And if it keeps cooling off, eventually we can't see any light, which is basically makes the star invisible. If it gets hotter, it actually moves closer to the ultraviolet light side and eventually gets to a star that um, doesn't produce much visible light, but when it does, it's blue. So very hot stars tend to be more blue, very cold stars tend to be more red. If they get more red, we can't see them. If they get more blue, we can't see them, and it's actually more purple, we can't see them. But this is called black box radiation. If you take a, the, take a look at the wavelengths, shorter wavelengths of violet, blue, and green penetrate deepest in water. And I would like you to draw this picture. And you can see depth of water down to about 200 meters. In open ocean, light travels a lot more because, again, there's not as much material, planktonic material floating in the surface. Uh, the plankton in the um, coastal waters, where we get a lot of nutrients, there's a lot of plankton. And because of that, the light doesn't penetrate as much. And if you take a look at the red fish, um, red fish down here, red is only going to show, the only reason we see things is it collects the light and bounces off, but there is no red light for this fish. And this is why fish way down deep don't tend to be the brighter colors. They tend to be more grays and blues maybe because blue is the deepest penetrating of all the light, regardless of uh, whether you're open ocean. And you can see it's more green light, green yellow light in coastal water. But when you get down to here, there's no light. And um, basically, fish do not have color for attraction or warning because there's no light to actually advertise it.
So open ocean, light penetrates a lot more and it's mostly blue. And in coastal water, light doesn't penetrate as much and it's mostly in the green-yellow zone. So you may want to use some uh, terminology and or colors when you color this. And then color related to turbidity and photosynthetic pigments. So if you actually take a look at um, what most light, uh, what the color the most photosynthetic pigments like, um, they tend to actually be in this range because it travels deeper in turbidity due to coastal water, whether it be plankton or particulates from uh, the water that's going in in terms of rivers, uh, turbidity cuts, cuts the sunlight down in uh, coastal waters. And then how deep is the world really? Should I? And eh, why not? Let's take a look at this. Thousand meters maximum sunlight. Grand Canyon, 1850. Average depth of the ocean, a little more than 4,000 meters. Notice we're getting into smaller amounts of the ocean. There's the height of Mount Everest, it was upside down, and you can see the ocean goes a lot deeper. Deepest that Cameron went, deepest down that Picard went, and then the Marianas Trench, that's the deepest the oceans are. Okay. And we're going to get a warning. I'm going to get a warning because I used copyright material. Photosynthetic marine organisms. Um, we have spermatophyta. Um, these are the basic uh, algae that requires lots of sunlight. You can see it's actually red color, so it's shallow water. Shallow water, eelgrass, and mangroves grow very uh, well. And then you also get macroscopic, macro meaning you can see them, algae. Uh, usually in shallow water, and they hold, they're hold they held there by holdfast, where they reach down. It's like a root-like material, except it holds the plant. It does not pull in nutrients like roots of a plant. It just holds the plant, and you can see it's holding onto these stones. Um, and then the algae goes up there. And these can be in lots of color, different colors. They can be brown algae, green algae, or red algae. And this is kelp, which is actually going up from holdfast at the bottom all the way up to the surface where the light's located. So they can be photosynthetic. Uh, microorganisms, things you can't see with your eyes, these tend to be much more dominant in the ocean. We Remember, we have two different kinds. We have salacious biologic ooze, like uh, 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 diatoms, sorry, which we can use for pool filters and the white cliffs of Dover, uh, the salacious diatom diatomaceous soil. And then we also have coccolithophores, which are calcareous oozes, which we can also use for filters. Um, they tend to be really small, and they do make uh, calcareous oozes. And then the last slide, dinoflagellates, really cool critters. Um, first thing, they tend to be sort of reddish in color, and they also tend to make what's called red tide, and that may actually look really cool, except that it's harmful, uh, produces poison, and you can see it causes caused by algae. It's naturally occurring. Um, there is some talk about pollution actually causing this more often. Causes uh, eye or skin irritation, coughing and sneezing, respiratory conditions. You should stay away from it. And don't harvest shellfish, which are filter feeders, because they'll actually uh, concentrate the uh, poisons. And, uh, and then when you ingest it, it's not good. But another neat thing about dinoflagellates is they actually make uh, nocturnal uh, phosphorescence, a bioluminescence, which is light from life. And I do want to show you this one as well, which these both these things actually tend to make our video a little longer, but this is just cool. So you get dinoflagellates in the ocean, and the ocean is actually making waves. And because of that, it's it's causing the dinoflagellate to give off photosynthetic photosynthetic light, biosynthetic bioillumination. So the photosynthetic bacteria are back there, and they're over there, and it looks like they're in that whole area. But then once the wave gets over, it gets out of the bacterial dinoflagellate area. 
and it's really cool stuff. Ships can go through these too, and you can see it in the wake of the fish. Dolphin also. Just really cool stuff. Okay, that about does it. I appreciate you stopping by, and that's our stop. That was 11A Bio Productivity, and we'll talk much more about it in time to come.